Good day and welcome to IMPACT, a community affairs discussion program from the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. I'm Jeff Frederick. Across the world, nearly 40,000 McDonald's are spread over 120 or more countries, with about 70 million customers each and every day. It's the world's largest restaurant chain, and Americans for about three quarters of a century have come to re rely upon the site of the Golden Arches, the image of Ronald McDonald, and the sight and smell of French fries to play in their restaurant, their evening meal, or a tasty treat. Among its many successes and innovations, McDonald's has streamlined production and maximized efficiency. They've modernized franchise operations, become a, a, a major American owner of real estate, and set the pace in the industry with advertising and tireless studies of itself and its competitors. Like all companies that evolve, their concepts and their customer experience are undoubtedly devised by teams of talented people working five, 10, and 20 years in the future. And while the cleanliness, convenience, and product lines of some other quick serve companies also inspire loyalty, nobody dominates the market quite like McDonald's. The story, however, cannot be told without focusing on local owners and the connections they make with local customers, employees, and communities. Here in southeastern North Carolina, Kenneth and Lisa, Lisa Rust own any number of stores, and they join me today to talk about their story, their customer service philosophy, and the ways in which local businesses can and do serve the community. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, for having us. So how did you all get in the hamburger business? Because <laughs> it didn't start out that way. How did you meet, and how did you get into this direction? <laughs> Well, so my family got into the McDonald's business in 1970. Uh, I was five years old. Um, my father had grown up on a dairy farm and in the late 60s uh, chose to leave that business. Um, uh, President Nixon had put in price controls on dairy and he decided there would be a better investment of his time and resources. Bounced around for a couple years and um, got into McDonald's. He actually trained all of 40 hours in one restaurant before receiving the keys to a brand new facility. He didn't know the hamburger business uh, for anything. Um, that was in Richmond, Virginia. We were there for three years. Prior to locating to Lumberton, he opened the first restaurant uh, here in the county, actually on Roberts Avenue in Lumberton. Uh, coincidentally, that restaurant happens to be the geographic midpoint between New York City and Miami, Florida, which is why Lumberton was chosen. Um, I've been doing McDonald's practically my whole life, mm -hmm. yet it wasn't a chosen career for me. Um, I'm a computer engineer by trade. Uh, I have a master's degree from North Carolina State, and my professional goals were all around being technical. I was fascinated by how fast computers could run and how mm -hmm. small they could make them. Um, having completed that degree and worked in the industry for about seven years, my parents started talking retirement. and. Mm -hmm. Lisa and I had a lengthy conversation, actually many of them, um, and really bad pun, a golden opportunity was about to disappear <laughs> right. from the family. You, you practiced that one, that's good. Uh, uh, so um, we uh, decided instead of uh, me going on and getting an MBA, uh, to actually spend a couple years kicking the tires and seeing if McDonald's was in our future. Um, that was 27 years ago and, and we haven't looked back. And your training at Furman had nothing to do with <laughs> running a quick-serve well, restaurant. No, my training was in music and communications. But as we found, uh, when we decided to go into this industry, our backgrounds in engineering and technology as well as communication really benefited uh, us and um, helped us move our uh, company along. And your um, passion for figuring out efficiency certainly played well in, in terms of uh, well, the it, business. It has. Uh, I had an opportunity very early in my McDonald's career uh, to uh, participate in some training with some of the, the local regional leadership. And uh, if, if you stay in the business long enough, the people that you meet early in your career get promoted. And um, uh, one of the, the people that I met uh, became the chief restaurant officer for the U.S. business. And she remembered my background in engineering and invited me to uh, be on a national technology team. And from there, I've had the opportunity to serve or chair on five different teams. 
So for those that don't know, McDonald's often operates on, not always, but often operates on a franchise basis. How does that work in broad strokes? Well, so most of your guests that are watching probably believe McDonald's Corporation is in the restaurant business. You referenced this slightly in your introduction. McDonald's is in the real estate business. They own all or control with long-term leases, the land under every building, and they own every building. So anything that we do to upgrade or even the initial construction, there's a lot of costs that are on our side of the ledger, but they're leaseholder improvements. We have a 20-year license at each location. So uh, ask me that question again, because I've, I've gone sideways. Here. So how, how does it, how do you become a franchise operator? How, how do they identify locations? How do they pick this real estate? You mentioned earlier the midway point uh, between New York and in South Florida. How, how does all of that get calculated? Well, so the, the company is um, and has the ability to be somewhat selective in their franchisees. Um, we had a, a, a foot in the door because my parents were in the business, but it was solely on their responsibility to do the training, but we had to meet McDonald's requirements in terms of the operational knowledge, and it's about a two-year program to work through. If you come from outside of the, the business in, you have to meet some significant financial screens before they'll even uh, certify you as a registered applicant. Coincidentally for, for us, um, we had been working, I had been working for a little startup company in Research Triangle Park, and during our training with McDonald's, that company uh, actually went public, and we cashed out of the stock that we had and, and qualified with McDonald's independently of my parents because there's a pretty stringent requirement in terms of both training and the financial piece that has to go together. And whether or not you come from a family where we would be considered second generation uh, candidates or you're someone coming in from outside, the requirements are still the same in terms of the training and financial uh, expectations. So a lot of that training probably has to deal with how to treat customers and how to deal with them. So what is the customer service philosophy that, that you all have as um, operators but also that uh, McDonald's has as a corporate? Oh, you want to start with us? And well for us and as as well as for the company, hospitality is important. Um, it's, it's of utmost importance that our customers when they come into our restaurants they feel welcome, they feel like they are in a space that they can enjoy because it's clean, because people are greeting them. We want to give them ex an experience. Yes, we want to be quick. We want to give them the hamburger or the french fries or the salad or whatever it is that they're wanting, but we also want it to be a good experience for them. And so many of them are coming in with their children or their grandchildren or it's a family experience. They're coming in to get the Happy Meals mm -hmm. and different things like that. And so we want it to be a positive experience positive experience and hospitality for us uh, for Kenneth and me especially has been important in our personal lives um, and as well as in the restaurants in that we think it's important that people know you care about them mm -hmm. and that that is extended not only to our customers but to our employees because our employees are our customers uh, that the people that work for us are also the people who are coming in as our customers and so we want to make sure that we're not only uh, good restaurant owners and operators to those who are coming in our doors for food but to those who choose to make a career with us or choose us as their first job or an interim job uh, between other things. You know when, when Ray Kroc first saw McDonald's, uh, Dick and Mac McDonald, the brothers out in uh, San Bernardino, California, uh, had the restaurant. They had a system of quality and service and cleanliness. And Ray adopted that as the model that he then basically spread across the country and now, now around the world. Um, you know, people have to eat, but they don't have to eat with us. Mm -hmm. And in most of our restaurants, you'll probably hear the greeting at either the front counter or the drive through thank you for choosing McDonald's. That's very intentional on our part um, because two things. We need our consumers to feel like we're appreciative for their business because they do have choices. Mm -hmm. And there should be a little bit of humility there because they do have choices. They can go any place to get lunch, but they've chosen to spend their hard-earned dollars with us. And we have an obligation to do that well. 
So your business philosophy is a combination of time-tested things that work for McDonald's, but also your personal values and your personal philosophy. It is. Yeah, and I think you know it can be seen here locally, the things that we choose to invest in and we choose to spend not only our time in, but our resources to be able to support things within the community that, that matter to us, whether it's the arts or education mm -hmm. uh, and different things like that. Have you ever stopped to figure out the number of people who probably in this uh, community got their first uh, job at McDonald's? You, you know, we ran, ran the math uh, a couple years ago and we figured that someplace between 10 and 12 percent of the county residents at one point in time had worked with us. Mm -hmm. um, we, we fill an interesting niche when it comes from jobs. We are our first job for many, many teenagers, yet there's a segment of the population who choose to make a career with us. And we, we take that obligation very seriously. Our industry as a whole probably has a pretty poor reputation in terms of the jobs that it offers and the benefit it, that are provided. That simply doesn't have to be the case. Uh, while we are franchisees with McDonald's Corporation and there is a system in which they uh, provide for us, the, the salaries and benefits and things that we offer our employees are solely of our own choosing. And uh, I, I give you an example. Um, I have a, uh, I actually met her son this morning, uh, but we have a, a long-term employee that uh, is actually in the hospital right now. And her, her son flew in from Texas over the weekend to, to see her. And she said, you've got to be in Kenneth's office first thing this, uh, on Monday to make sure everything's fine with my job. And it's like, <laughs> she can work with us as long as she wants to. She yeah. has been with us for the time that we've owned the restaurant, but she worked with the previous owners before us. And, and it's, it's, don't worry, your job it's is here. Be okay. yeah. it, it, we just it's want okay. you to get better. We just want you to get well. But in talking about that, it gives us great joy to know that she is going to be able to rest and get well because we offer uh, the same uh, benefits in terms of insurance to her that we have ourselves. And so, you know, that's one of the benefits that you may or may not see uh, in other areas in the industry, but that we're really pleased to be able to offer. So what I hear you saying is you're not really in the food business, you're in the people business. And the people that you're taking care of are both your customers, but also your employees. Mm -hmm. Oh, a absolutely. And having the right people in the restaurant make all the difference. You know, this business isn't built on today's visit. It's built on tomorrow's visit. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, one of the, the first things that we teach in our, any of our manager trainees is the most important visit that this current customer has is their next one. Mm -hmm. And if there's an issue with this one, just make it right. right. Because frequency of visit is, is, is how this works. We want people to be able to say yes to our customers. So, and to their needs. And in thinking about that next visit, there are always some changes that you might be contemplating. How, how do you gather market data, both yourselves and how does McDonald's do it to help you make informed decisions? Well, so McDonald's, there are multiple layers into our marketing and our advertising. Obviously, there's the local level um, that, that we, we choose to participate with, um, like sponsorships that we have over here at the university. Um, but on a more of a slightly larger level, there, there's an advertising cooperative. The restaurants um, in our local cooperative range from Wilmington down at the beach all the way up to Roanoke, Virginia. It's kind of this corridor that's most of North Carolina, but a little bit of South Carolina and, and Virginia. And uh, we have uh, uh, professional ad agencies that manage uh, that business, and they're pulling a significant amount of data in terms of uh, trends, uh, for the consumers as well as uh, what they're purchasing. And then there's a national basis where we all pool our resources. And as you can imagine with our scale, uh, there's a pretty good economy of scale for mm -hmm. our dollars being spent on a national basis. But what most people don't realize is because all of the McDonald's are using a collective um, uh, point of sale software, uh, McDonald's is gathering transactional level data for every transaction in every restaurant and on every hour of every day and that's all pulled together and with the, amaz the amazing computer power that's out there now, you can pretty much determine trends both for ordering as well as trends for what people like and, 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 and what, where you should move with that. But there's also a great deal of time spent 
looking at what the consumer's need states are. You know, some people are, are in a hurry. They, those are the ones that go through the drive-through. Mm -hmm. And in today's business, those are the ones that order on their mobile app and then just check in with us. They completely avoid the ordering and process the entirely. the portion of our business. Oh, the drive-through drive is by far, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a, a little different for McDonald's. Outside of the U.S., the drive-through is not the largest portion of the business. But in the U.S. it is. We just happen to be that, that type of a consumer base. Um, but with, with the data that, that is pulled, we're able to, to project out for our consumers. Th there was a big study that was done about a decade ago looking into the future. And th they pretty much boiled down to what the consumers want to, to something fairly basic. They want a quality product. They want it served with fresh ingredients that they can recognize, I guess. You, and trust. And, and trust. They want it served uh, in a clean environment, but they want it served with the convenience and the choice and how they control the interaction. And that convenience and choice part has led us to things like uh, serving breakfast all day long. And it's led us to having a mobile app and now uh, delivery in many locations where uh, we have some third party partners that are able to do that for us. So It's led to the kiosks and the restaurants that you see and things like that because our customers, some want to go through the drive through mm -hmm. others want to come in and have a different experience, and some may want to interact with someone at the front counter, others would like to order from the kiosk or shop because they're not really sure what they want yet and spend time doing that or customizing their orders, and so it's all based upon what the customer desires. And again, that goes back to that hospitality of not just determining here's what we're going to do for you or give you or serve you, but looking at what does the person want? What do they want? And how can I say yes to that? So a common set of philosophies, but a differentiated group of customers. The seven o'clock morning coffee crowd is substantially different from the 10 o'clock drive-in mm -hmm. mobile app, get me my quarter pounder mm -hmm. on the run. Absolutely. You also, um, I really like the idea of the next visit concept that you had in terms of a philosophy because you are all, as franchisees across the country, you're all interdependent because if someone has a bad experience in Tennessee mm -hmm. and they're driving down 95 to go to Florida, they may not pull they, off at exit 22 or 20. They, they're not going to give us a time of day. We are very dependent upon the franchisees in wherever your home community of doing a good job. Um, that's that's pretty much critical in our system is, is for that that to work and uh, so we feel an obligation to our fellow uh, franchisees and the other owner operators to do this right because our customers as they travel will be their customers mm -hmm. and we have a lot of help doing that yeah. we have the infrastructure with our 11 restaurants to be able to have a director of operations Ron Willette and have three supervisors that work within those restaurants so that across the board you'll see a similar experience mm -hmm. at each of those restaurants so that we have tried to create a culture that is both welcoming and efficient but also that is consistent so that we have operational consistencies mm -hmm. and excellence. What would you say are the most the biggest cha the changes of the last couple of years some of them you've already referenced and where do you see mm -hmm. the industry going in the next five or ten years? Well, be, because of the, the, the change in this digital age, um, I would expect that automation is going to continue as we go forward. And not so much automation to eliminate jobs, but automation to free up some employees to do different jobs. If you go into our restaurants, um, middle of this past year, as we started to put kiosks in all our locations, some of that seven o'clock crowd that you referenced were upset with us that we were taking away people's jobs. But at the same time that we put the kiosk in the restaurants, we changed our inside service model to be one of table service. Mm -hmm. Once you order, you go have a seat. We're gonna bring that to you and we're going to check on you during your visit mm -hmm. and even bust the table when you're done. So it's, it, it's repurposing and repositioning mm -hmm. people. Um, to, to try to improve that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I see those things going, uh, continuing to accelerate as we go forward. 
We find in looking at our students that the student of 2019 is substantially different than the student of 2009, mm -hmm. than the mm -hmm. student of 1999, and that's causing us to think about interesting and new developments and ways in which we deliver instruction. Do you find the same thing, that your customers are constantly changing? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes, and um, you referenced your students. Let me refer to our, our, uh, our employees. In the last five years, we've gone from all of our training being done, sit down at a computer and watch a video, have a printed sheet that you follow up to, uh, to basically verify the, the verification. Now everything is delivered through the cloud with a handheld device at the station, shoulder to shoulder with, with, with a trainer. Um, and the videos, instead of being 5, 10, 20 minutes, are now 90 seconds. Um, we've, we've moved into that bite-sized YouTube mentality, but that's okay because that's how this generation wants to learn, so you, you provide the, the tools. I, I hate to say it, but we need, we need to keep up. We need to be cool where possible. <laughs> we do, we still require people to look alike and wear uniforms and all that other good stuff, so those things aren't gonna change, but we can uh, marry up with the, uh, the population and the demographics that, that, that we're serving. And I think a lot of people would be surprised at just how high tech our kitchens are. I have such great respect for our employees who work in our kitchens, who work behind the counter, and I don't think people realize just how much uh, demand there is in terms of, of what they know um, and with the equipment and that sort of thing. And so that has sort of married both the need for additional technology and keeping up, if not being a leader ahead of things, with this next generation that's coming that is, is so... Uh, hands-on and uh, efficient at those types of things. So the computer engineer in you is loving this because all oh, of the interesting ways in which you can train and retrain, all the ways in which you can automate the kitchen process, all of the ways in which you can serve mm -hmm. all these different kinds of customers, it all goes back to gathering and making decisions off of data. Well, it does, and folks around here may be surprised to know that because of his engineering background and his working on the national level, Kenneth, uh, chaired the team that designed the latest design of the kitchen for McDonald's mm. USA. And so a lot of those efficiencies he and his team brought about. Mm. And we had the privilege of testing in our restaurants before anyone else in the country. Yeah, restaurant uh, had number one was in St. Paul's, North Carolina. Yes. So um, we have, we have that, that honor, that claim to fame, I guess. So you mentioned earlier that you have 11 different stores. Do the, each store represent a difference in terms of the products that they prefer to buy at that store? Do you find similarities among Southeast North Carolina customers? Well, so the, the product mix is similar because of the offerings are similar. Um, the, the stores do vary based upon the demographics. Um, I'll give you one, one example. We, we have three locations here in Lumberton and the three restaurants, uh, while they're less than three miles apart from one another, uh, perform very differently. Um, the, the restaurant on West Fifth Street is a pretty heavy breakfast and, and lunch uh, uh, business, but afternoons and evenings are fairly slow. You, you move up to Roberts Avenue, which is near the hospital, and it pretty much starts first thing in the morning and just run, runs all day long and all night long. And then the newest location that we opened on, on uh, Fayetteville Road there at Liberty Hill, um, is much more um, a work time. Uh, so we've got breakfast, dinner, and lunch, but there's not much on, on either, either side of that. So mm -hmm. it's amazing how the patterns are different when you're just that far apart from one another. And the really funny thing is when we opened the restaurant here at UNCP, we were used to restaurants that had a really busy breakfast, early breakfast. And we were wondering, where is everybody? <laughs> they're in the library study. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. No, they're not up yet. <laughs> So we, we sort of learned by the pattern for students here and, and faculty and everything. Yes, if you want to see your students, come over to the restaurant sometime between 10 at night and 2 in the morning. Yes. They're over there in mass. Mm -hmm. Still studying, though. Oh, yes. Of course Absolutely. they are. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you for telling me that. So um, what's the process in terms of you identifying, you know, the employee that best represents your values and your philosophy? How do you help to make sure that you find the person who embodies the spirit that you want your customers to see? Well, we actually, so s selection I is critical. We, um, several years ago, we moved from a one-on-one -on -one interview with all new hires to a group interview setting with the goal of being, um, to at least with an initial interview, 
to try to hire for personality. So we are, uh, we've actually instructed our, 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 our folks that are doing those interviews to look for people that you would put in service. So we, we call it, we're hiring cashiers. We can teach anyone to cook, but to be able to look you in the eye and mm -hmm. smile at you and genuinely be pleasant, that, that's a pretty critical uh, customer satisfaction skill to have. Knowing that on average, half of our managers are gonna get promoted out of our kitchens, uh, if we haven't hired for that personality to begin with, then all of a sudden half of our management teams are going to be lacking those uh, people skills that we need. Um, and, and that, to be quite honest with you, that one change in our interviewing and our selection process has transformed um, our staff uh, as we couple that with our hospitality initiatives. What would you say are the time-tested elements of um, operating such a business that were true with your first store and your first experience and that will be true despite all of these new changes in, in new data analytics? What does it mean to be one of your team? I think it means that you truly feel a part of a team. You aren't there by yourself. You're not doing something by yourself. We're all better when we all do our best and we lift one another up. Uh, people rise and fall to your expectations. And so we try to be a positive environment, whether it's for that teenager and it's their first job or for someone who is working with us longer, who has a career path and uh, wants opportunity to learn new skills and move around the restaurant and learn those skills so that they could become a manager. Uh, and so um, being a part of the team is important. And I think being committed to those values that, um, that Ray Kroc started to begin with. I, I would agree with that. The, um, it, it, it truly is a, a people business. And what we have found is if what's good for our employees is good business. And when we do the right things for our staff, they do the right things for our consumers. Lisa referenced the, um, how do we find a way for our, our staff to say yes? And, and that, that's actually critical. One of the things we do in our new hire orientations is we talk through customer recovery. And the very first step of that is believe the customer when they tell you they have an issue. Don't ask for a receipt, just, mm. just do the right thing. And, and you, you know, whether that, uh, be the golden rule that we learned in Sunday school yesterday or whether that, that be in business. Doing the right thing often is the, is the right thing. And this leads you, and I won't ask you guys to comment too much on this, this leads you to be very involved in the community as well with a lot of support for various causes. It does. It does. We, um, first and foremost, it's for our employees, uh, their educational plans and um, the opportunity to help them uh, in a holistic way, not only through employment, but we have a corporate chaplain that uh, works with them and is available to them mm -hmm. to help meet some needs that maybe Kenneth and I can't as employers, uh, you know, things like that, or when things like Hurricane Matthew or crises occur uh, to be able to help them. But then also within our community, whether it be the hospital or the schools, it gives us a platform to be able to work w within. Lisa and Kenneth Russ, thank you for taking us behind the golden arches and a little bit about what happens every day at McDonald's. Sure. Join us next time on Impact.